Hello everybody, welcome to another reading wrap up. I can't say weekly because I seem to have fallen into the fortnightly schedule with these wrap ups, but that's just the way that life has been recently. I'm gonna go with it. So well, let's talk about books I've read over the past two weeks. I will start by quickly mentioning The Drowning Girl by Caitlin R. Kiernan. I just finished reading this and it's one of the otherwise award winners. So I'll be talking about this in the next batch wrap up, which should be very soon. I have one more book to finish reading before I can film that. I very much enjoyed this novel. I kind of avoided it for years despite it being critically acclaimed because I thought it was going to be a very dark horror. It isn't really. It's more of a very strange ghost story or a story of haunting, like hauntings as memes. Um, the original idea of the meme, not like Twitter GIF memes. Um, but it's told from the point of view of a woman with schizophrenia who has a very unreliable memory and is aware of that. And yeah, very interesting. It didn't have as much clarity by the end as I would prefer for plots, um, but it was a very interesting reading experience. Next up, I'll just quickly mention that I read volume 15 of Lumberjanes. This one is called Birthday Smarty, and it's written by Shannon Waters and Kat Lee, and the artwork is by Anne Marie Rogers. Apologies to the creators. I'm about to be very harsh on some aspects of this. I absolutely hate Rogers artwork. I believe that she's drawn for this comic series in the past, and I think that her art style is ugly. And I think it makes all the characters look like misshapen potatoes, and it's impossible to tell some of the characters apart because they look virtually identical as lopsided potato heads. And on top of that, the particular story in this was not my favorite either. One of the characters is trying to throw a very big convoluted surprise birthday party for another character who does not in fact want this. And everybody spends most of this volume unhappy and stressed and unable to explain to another character why they don't want the thing that everybody is stressing out about. I, ju I just can't. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't, it was not abjectly terrible, but it came close to it for me, unfortunately. Well, I, I'm asking myself now, why am I still reading Lumberjanes? This is volume 15. 16 is almost here and I have an extra volume of one-off stories checked out from the library, but I think I may need to stop reading the series for my own sanity if nothing else. <laughs> So moving on, the next thing I have to talk about is The Family Tree by Sherry S. Tepper. I buddy read this with Joe from Final Blow Joe. Uh, we've read a bunch of Tepper's novels together, which means we can have some very interesting conversations about the similarities and differences we see between her novels. Um, this was such an interesting book because I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I mean, just on the storytelling level, this is probably one of the best Tepper novels I've read. I just wanted to keep going with it. I enjoyed almost all of the characters, all of the points of view. Once again, as is pretty typical with me in Tepper's novels, I love seeing how she brings together um, often very, very different, seemingly unrelated storylines and finally fitting them all together so you can see how they are actually related. I think Joe and I agreed that as much as we enjoyed reading the book, we did not agree with a really big ethical decision made in the book, which is the foundation of the entire premise. Um, and, and I can't talk about a lot of the plot specifics without massively spoiling things, so I'm going to kind of be vague here. But this is an environmental novel. Um, most of the things I've read by Tepper in the past have had very strong feminist themes, very much examining um, misogyny and sexism in uh, science fiction or fantasy secondary worlds, and frequently the role of religion in misogyny as well. And she she is often also thrown in a little bit of like in, environmental or eco science fiction, and I've always found those tidbits interesting. This is a novel where the environmentalism is the point. It is in the foreground and the the feminist elements are there but kind, kind of in the background. And I, I really enjoy environmental science fiction. 
This is about the relationship between humanity and our environment, how humans have treated and, and impacted the the natural world and other non-human creatures. And so very interesting, but leads to some ethical questions that I uh, don't think were answered appropriately. And it kind of leads me to wondering what is that dividing line between Tepper's personal opinions and what she's actually put in the mouths of her characters. I want to be very cautious about that line between the author and their fictional work. You can't always tell what an author believes based on, on what they've put into their fiction. But I do think at the same time that Tepper is frequently very preachy and pedantic in her novels. It is one of the things I sometimes criticize her books for being, which gives me the sense that actually, yeah, you can tell something about her personal views from her novels. And if that's the case here, I think I very much disagree with the answer to the problem in this book. It's an interesting but perhaps flawed novel, let's say that. Next, I listened on audiobook to Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. And I picked this up because I am asexual and I was very curious about what this would say. Um, like many asexual people, I discovered that asexuality in human beings is a real thing through fiction. And this book is kind of something I wish had existed a long time ago, something I could give to my younger self that would explain what asexuality is and also what it isn't, kind of correct some of the stereotypes about it. It, it is comprehensive and also compassionate. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend this book if you are on the ace spectrum. It isn't just about asexuality, it also covers some things like demisexuality and aromanticism and the, the differences between these. And there are interviews with um, a lot of people on the ace spectrum. But I would also recommend this for people who are not necessarily ace but know somebody who is or just want to understand what asexuality is. There are a lot of good definitions in this. And I would also recommend it to people for kind of what the subtitle of the book says, this analysis of how um, the assumption, the, the default assumption of sexual attraction, sexual desire, lust, if you will, um, is so deeply ingrained in our society. It's ingrained in how our society and our culture function. It is embedded in popular media, in our entertainment. It even underpins our legal system. And I think this book is an interesting way of looking at that through the lens of asexuality for people who do not experience this attraction. What is it like to live in a world that assumes you must uh, and assumes that you understand what, what this feeling is and you simply don't feel it? Um, so yeah. A very interesting book. I would pretty much recommend it for everybody, I guess is what I'm saying. And yeah, I'm not sure how much more I want to say about it because it's a deeply personal book. It's impossible to talk about what this is saying without relating it to my own personal private life, and that is not something I necessarily want to do all the time, but this 100% is going to be one of my favorite best books of the year. Next, I read a poetry collection called Peluda by Melissa Lovada Oliva. I learned about this from Shannon at That So Po. She did a review of this poetry collection that I will link for you guys because it inspired me to read this. I think she talks about it much more eloquently than I am going to hear. Um, this is a poetry collection about hair and hairiness, but also uh, the immigrant experience and an immigrant family. The word peluda means hairy one, basically, like hairy beast. So a lot of the poems in this are about hair, about unwanted hair in various places and getting rid of it, but also how that is part of uh, the poet's relationship with her family and just her life and childhood and everything. I really enjoyed the topics and themes of all of the poems in this. Um, the only thing that I didn't super click with is the format of some of the poems. I think 
that the that she is like a performance poet, like maybe spoken word poet. I'm, don't quote me on that, I may have remembered that wrong. But um, I felt like the formatting of some of the poems, like the one that's completely in all caps, not my thing at all. Um, but there was, there were so many interesting lines. The titles of a lot of the poems are just hilarious and wonderful. Um, so very, very much a collection that I would recommend for its themes. Um, I'm not really sure if I love the formatting of the poems though. Next is Or What You Will by Joe Walton. I really enjoyed this book and it is very odd. This is very intellectual, philosophical fantasy that I think is like deeply engaged with the act of creation, what it's like to be an author, where do you get your ideas, and it kind of takes the concept of the imaginary friend that a lot of people have in childhood and brings that into adulthood, into the mind of an author, um, who has like a fully formed other person in her head who she speaks to and who inhabits many of the characters in her fiction. So the story is about Sylvia, a fantasy writer in Montreal, I believe, um, who has a person who is male in her head, um, and Sylvia is dying and the narrator, this person in her head doesn't want to die. He is trapped in the cave of bone and he wants to continue on in some way. And he's basically trying to convince Sylvia to write them an exit into her last novel, into this fictional fantasy world called Illyria, so that they can go there and continue on, immortal. And is that even possible or not? This is a fascinating idea. I think that Walton really pulled it off. I, I think that I was sometimes a little bit yanked out of the storytelling because I've read a lot of Walton's books and I've read her most recent novels, so I could clearly see parallels between Joe Walton and her her career itself with the the fictional storyteller in in the novel. I think there's a lot of self insertion here. Um, a lot of Walton has gone into the novel, and people who have never read her previous books may not necessarily pick up on that. Um, at some points, I found it a little bit distracting, and yet at the same time, it makes the book even more interesting. So. This, this is probably a novel for people who are very interested in novel writing, in writing SFF and what is what that's like. Um, so yeah, very intellectual, very philosophical. I didn't follow all of it, but it was a great read. And the last book that I have to talk about today is Girl Waits with a Gun by Amy Stewart. This is the first in what I would kind of call a historical mystery series. I think it's called The Cop Sisters. This first one, though, I think it was intended to be a standalone before it became a series, and it is based on a real person, Constance Cop, who was one of the first ever female under sheriffs, uh, de deputies in the United States around 1915. So number one, Constance Cop was a real person and if you go look her up, a lot of the book will be spoiled for you because um, pretty much everything that is known about Cop is used as a, a basis for this novel, including um, a pretty major revelation in the book. So uh, basically what happens is that the cop sisters, Constance and her two younger sisters, Norma and Florette, um, are in an accident when a local wannabe gangster um, runs his motor car into their buggy. Um, they escape with relatively minor injuries and they want uh, the man, 
Kaufman to pay for the damage. Constance repeatedly sends him letters and asks for money for the repairs, which they are duly owed, and instead he starts harassing them. Um, he's basically in with the mafia, and they start uh, coming by the cop sisters' farm. They're pretty isolated out in the country, harassing them, threatening the youngest sister with kidnapping and white slavery, or basically selling her into prostitution. This is the real history, and what happens is Constance does go to the police, to the sheriff, and ends up working with the sheriff to help catch the pathetic local gangster, basically. Um, there's also a side plot about a woman and her missing baby, which is entirely fictional. I really liked the, the general idea of this. Um, it was an enjoyable story. Um, this very much feels like historical fiction, not necessarily mystery, but like I said, I think it moves more into like detective fiction in the rest of the series. But in this first one, it's very much a historical novel. And my only major criticism of it would be like two things. One, the book was too long. It was definitely definitely padded and slowed down, and it needed to be a bit faster. Some of the fluff could have been taken out. But also, the main character doesn't do very much. Um, most the, the cop sisters just sort of hang out, getting worried and not doing anything about their situation. They were just very naive about the whole thing. And that made me very frustrated. It was not what I expected from the way that this, the book is marketed, I guess. All in all, it was pretty enjoyable though, and I think I will listen to the audiobook of the second in the series to see if perhaps uh, Stuart diverges from the original history, makes the characters a little bit more active, and, and does her own thing with the premise now. So those are all the things that I have read in the past two weeks. Do let me know if you have read these or if you want to. Leave me a comment down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with another video. And until then, bye.